welcome to InspiredInsider.com. We have the founder of the Immerman Angels. Listen in this interview how Johnny made it his life's mission to help people fight cancer. Also, what's the one thing he thinks you should do to overcome business and personal challenges? He also talks about the advice his mentor gave him when he was thinking about starting the foundation. That and much more in the interview coming up. Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Johnny Immerman, founder of Immerman Angels. Immerman Angels, just to tell you a little bit about them, they carefully match a person touched by cancer, a cancer fighter or survivor, with someone who's fought and survived the same type of cancer, a mentor angel. Uh, cancer caregivers such as spouses, parents, children, friends can also benefit from the one-on-one -on -one connections with other caregivers and survivors, which I was amazed about. The service is absolutely free and available to anyone touched by any type of cancer at any stage, any age, living anywhere in the world. And today they have the largest network of cancer survivors in the world, more than 4,000 cancer survivors, over 1,500 caregivers. They live in all 50 states and over 60 countries. And that's unbelievable. Um, Immerman Angels has been featured by the Wall Street Journal, Harpo Radios, Oprah and Friends, Dr. Oz, CNN, Huffington Post, just to name a few. And Johnny's received 2012 CNN Hero Award, 2012 Salute of Gratitude from the City Council of Chicago, 2012 Susan G. Komen Pink Tie Guy Award, and several others. Johnny, thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Jeremy, so much for having us. We're flattered. You know, we're, we're a humble group here, but a passionate group. In that we've come a long way, but we've got a long way to go. But we want to help change the cancer space and make sure that people who fight cancer are able to find those who've been there and had a positive outcome. And you are, and you are doing that, and you are doing that. And before we get started, and people need to hear your story and the story of Immerman Angels, I like to include one fun fact. And fun fact about Johnny is he's been a vegan for two and a half years, and he hasn't drunk alcohol in eleven years, right? Sure. It's uh, 11 years and counting, and probably never again, but we'll see. You never say never. Right. <laughs> so there's many people who talk about, we have so many things stopping us in life. The questions, you know, how do we overcome what seems insurmountable obstacles? And you're the perfect person to talk about this, how we overcome personal and even business challenges. Could you tell us a little bit about what was your inspiration for starting Immerman Angels? You know, the real inspiration, Jeremy, was trying to find meaning and purpose and why at 26 years old you find yourself in surgery and months of chemo and then think you beat it and then a recurrence with four tumors behind my kidneys and my spine and another surgery. I mean, from 26 to about 28 and a half, I went through all these medical extraordinary things that most of my friends in the 20s were not. And afterward, I looked at the system and I really believe today it's the duty of all survivors, each one of us, to look at the system and then find a crack in the system and then plug it. Do something to fill that. And we'll give back. And for me, giving back and then sharing my story with another guy who is my age and is going through the same thing. Because I, I could tell him, hey, buddy, you know, I know you're in your first week. You just found out you have testicular cancer and you're scared. Well, guess what? I was scared too. But it's all right. You, know, you can do it. I beat it. Here's what I know. I've learned all this along the way. That's what chemo feels like. You should eat probably during chemo. Don't eat that stuff. That didn't work for me. At least be careful of that. Um, working out, here's what you probably won't be able to work out. All these insider tips that survivors have because we've simply lived through the experience need to be given back and shared. And when I was sick, Jeremy, to be very direct, I had the most best support unit in the world. I had the best mom that was there every minute, every chemo, every surgery, the whole time. Every minute. My brother was great, my friends were great, I had a lot of people around me doing chemo every day, but I simply didn't know any younger adults who were also athletes, who were also survivors. And there's a disconnect. 
and women angels was created to basically fill that void. So when somebody at any age, you don't have to be young adult, you could be 56 and have colon cancer, and we say, look, we know an angel. You should know. We know Gus. Gus lives in D.C. And he beat stage 2 colon cancer, the same type you got diagnosed with this morning. You got to know this guy because he, he's living proof. You can do it one-to-one -one with these two in the same room. It's like magic to watch this friendship go. It's inspiration, it's encouragement, it's, it's knowledge, it's tips along the way, it's friendship at the right time, all based around one word, which is empathy. What was it like, can you tell us what it was like when you first found out, and what do you tell people that you mentor? Because that's got to be really difficult. Yeah, when I first found out, I was scared. Um, I had no idea when they're telling me they're going to cut my testicle out, and then I'm going to bank sperm. I'm like, whoa, what's that all about? And I remember walking in by myself. My mom said to me, do you want me to come with you to the sperm bank? And I was like, no, no, mom, that's cool. You know, I'll do it by myself. Like a typical guy at 26. I remember walking in there by myself just being like, what am I doing? Like, this is bizarre. You know, I don't, I just really, it just didn't make sense. It happened so fast. And then all of a sudden you're going into chemo for eight hours a day. And you feel like you're blindfolded. In a dark forest trying to navigate out. It's hard to know which way to turn because you just don't know where you're going or where you're trying to get to and it's just it's just a scary process. So for me that first week, and I say for most people the first 45 to 60 days, it's like the dust is everywhere. You know, it's like a windstorm. You really don't know what ends up. Um, you're nervous, you're scared, there's this whole new jargon of terms, things like alpha feta proteins and beta HCG and banking sperm and pick lines and ports and mucogens and elastas and prednisone and cisplatin and all these drugs and names and you're, you're trying to understand what it all means overnight. It would be like taking the final exam of a four month college class the first day you show up. You know, how do I know? I don't know everything, of course, because I'm in it. You know, the bell rung and I'm in it. And so I think a lot of people, including myself, you feel unsure and you feel isolated and you have questions, and you don't really, it's great to have friends and family, but you don't really have most people, someone who's like, oh, I've been through this, you know, I can answer a lot of that for you. Yeah. From the inside out. And that was the impetus. That's why we created Everman Angels, and we started the journey. It's the simplest story in the world. You know, after I beat it, I didn't know any survivors. I prayed every morning and every night that if I lived, I would do something to give back and help other people. And so what I started doing about two months after my last chemo was going back to my local cancer center after work, back to my local cancer center on the weekends, and just walking in rooms, usually younger people because I knew I'd relate to them more, and walking in and saying, oh, what's your name? Oh, you're Lisa? You're 24? You got leukemia? Well, I'm 27, and I just went through testicular cancer. And immediately you're friends. And immediately Lisa's got 25 questions for you about well, what did you go through? Did you get this funky rash? And, why was your port in your arm? My port was up here, is up here. And immediately, you're, you're friends for all the obvious reasons. Someone's like, how could you not be? You just click. Because you're the only two people in the world who get what it's like to, to be young. You can't answer. At least so it feels. And um, over time, I realized walking door to door is a much more scalable model. It shouldn't be just one guy in suburban Detroit going door to door in his local cancer center. There's survivors everywhere. Every one of us has a story. You know, as a team, as a network, we're strong. And then we started recruiting survivors, one angel after the next. In total, we recruited now over 4,000. Every one of them has a story. Everyone's come out on top. And matched with the right person at the right time can move a mountain for that person. And that's what it's all about. Yeah. I want to hear about some of the things you did to get this out there in recruiting. But first, tell us about one of those tough things to overcome with running Immerman Angels. How did you, I mean, having the idea and actually getting it out there and having it thrive is, is a different story and it's difficult. What is one of those tough times uh, when you're running it? Yeah, there's no, there's no question about it. It is, it's been a challenge for us to grow it and build it, but that's part of any organization. And, um, we're the biggest in the world for what we do, but there's always challenges, and I think you have to expect more of them, because the goal is, you know, how do we have the perfect person for you at the perfect time? And we're real close. 
with over 4,000, that's great. But we always think, you know, bigger and aim high over here. And we thank God if we had 4 million survivors and they're out there. If we had 4 million, we would have an exact match every time. It was exactly like you by listening to your same hometown. We're getting closer every day and we've come a long way. But the biggest challenge is awareness. How do we get the awareness out there so more survivors join us, help us get to that 4 million? or 10 million plus, I mean, as many survivors as want to join, we want every one of them. And then in addition, how do we reach more hospitals and more doctors so they know their patients can be sent to us and we can help them? So we can help every one of them, but if they don't know us, we can't. Yeah, and that's a tough problem. How do you overcome that? How do you, you know, increase awareness or reach more hospitals? Because, I mean, a lot of people, whether it's a nonprofit or in general um, in their business, that, that's always an issue. Exactly right. You know, the way we create awareness right now to grow and help more people is simply, there are really simply three main buckets. The first bucket is the hospital system. So doctors, nurses, social workers, we spend a lot of time speaking to them to basically send people in so we can help more people. They're similar to referrals. Bucket number two, groups like Livestrong, American Cancer Society, Keen and Lymphoma Society, the Silver Lining Foundation, Coleman, all these groups send us referrals for one-on-one -on -one support. We do what they don't do, and they do what we don't do. So together, we got to partner, we got to work together, cross-refer to make sure people find what they need. That's the second way of the cancer partners. The third way is pound the pavement. It's the t-shirts right here that we all wear. It's the wristbands. It's the Wall Street Journal, the Huffington Post, CNN, TED Talk, whatever we can do to get the word out to the mass public. If you know somebody who's touched by cancer, have them call us. And if you know somebody who is a survivor who wants to give back, have them call us because we want to get them in the network. And that's what makes the whole program strong. So what's been, I know there's a lot of inspirational moments and things. What's been one of the proudest, most memorable moments for you after starting Immerman Angels? You know, the proudest moment for me is when you get those emails, and we get a lot of them, and I love every one of them. You never get old. You get an email or a call, and sometimes it's a letter that somebody just hand writes, and it says, I beat my cancer. My name's Marissa. I'm 32. I beat ovarian cancer. I live in Alabama. You guys matched me up with Amy, who lives in Kansas, and she's 38 and beat the same ovarian cancer, and I beat it, and I'm better now, and that friendship changed my life. And I'm so grateful. Thank you so much for the inspiration and the introduction to Amy. You know, I'll never forget this. This really changed my life. That's what we love around here. When you get those messages, and those notes, um, that's what it's all about. You know you had impact. And there's one goal in this organization. It's about one-on-one -on -one cancer support. The end goal is impact. How do survivors impact the lives of those fighting today? Make it easier, make them more motivated, give them the knowledge they need to get to the finish line and increase the likelihood that they get to the finish line. Yeah, and I'm sure you get a lot of those stories too. What's been uh, another big challenge with running Immerman Angels and getting the word out? Um, you know, our, our, a big challenge for us, I think we really figured it out as of last July, but I would say it's the biggest challenge we've had as an organization is using how to use technology to help us be better. How to use tech, and, and basically the, the number one thing I'm talking about here is the database. You know, how, do we, how, do we, how do we use the data that we have to mass people up accurately and get the right people hooked up at the right time? And uh, we're on our 4.0. So our 1.0 is my laptop that I'm on right now, which is uh, you know, a Mac address book and just simple keyword searching and meeting survivors and typing their story into the notes and, you know, whatever their profile is and then searching and then by email or however. And uh, they're really doing it manually, huh? Yeah. 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 And the days were just a few of us and that's all it was, you know, seven, eight years ago. And today we've upgraded and our 4.0 is Salesforce. And Salesforce has been a godsend for us. It's such a more simple program to match people internally but also to keep track of who's matched when. Um, it's been an amazing, amazing resource. Um, it's just not something I'm an expert in. You know, I don't know a ton about tech. 
we finally figured out what system to use. And of course, migrating databases is never fun. Uh, but we've gotten that done. And as of July, our team's a lot happier in Salesforce. And it's making us much more efficient internally to manage the data. Because again, there's so many thousands of people. We talked about the 4,000 plus survivors. But there's also 1,500 plus caregivers. And the caregivers are mothers, brothers, wives, husbands, children, anyone connected to that person with cancer, because we match them too. We can match mm -hmm. the mama, the five-year-old with neuroblastoma, who's totally isolated, match her up with another mom who says, my kid's 12, but when she was five, she had the same neuroblastoma, and she beat it. And we speak the language, and we understand what you're going through, because we went through this one-to-one -one mom's match. So when you add in the caregiver piece, you have even more people as you're matching, a couple more thousand. So managing all that data, being the right two people match at the right time, and then yeah. monitoring, and then following up. I mean, there's just a lot of moving parts. But I would say that's probably been our biggest challenge, is figuring out what that tech piece should look like. And uh, I think we've got it. As of last July, we've got it. Okay. We have a lot of people who listen who are in tech, so if you have any other awesome solutions for Johnny, Contact him and, and email him. Um, uh, I, I love ideas. Right. And um, the other question I had was, um, what's the best advice you've heard from Mentor Angel? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of great advice out there. What are some, maybe the top two pieces of advice that you've heard from Mentor Angel that all of us can apply to overcoming challenges and obstacles? Jeremy, great question. You know, there's a lot of tips that can come along the way. Um, one of the best tips is that a lot of people don't know this. The first day of chemo, anxiety levels are so high because people like myself, I had eight hours of chemo, my first week of chemo, Monday through Friday, every day. Wow. Monday through Friday. And I thought for sure within two minutes of chemo going into my veins, I would be throwing up. And I would be puking, and I would be nauseous, because like that's what you think about when you think about chemotherapy. People right. are sick, they're nauseous, they don't feel good, they throw up. And after five minutes of chemo, when I washed the drip in my arm, I looked up at my nurse, and I said, "Hey, you know, I I'm sorry, I don't think this chemo's working." And she looked at me, she said, "What do you mean? Why, why do you think it's not working?" And I said, "Because I'm not sick yet. I'm like, I go in my arm, I can see it, but I, I don't know if this is the right stuff. Because I'm not sick, I feel fine." And she said, you know, listen, kid, just relax. You know, sit down, take it easy. It might be a couple of days. And sure enough, it was about three days, maybe the fourth day, that Thursday of eight-hour chemo days when I started to feel fatigue and nausea. But you just don't know that going in. There was so much anxiety the night before. I couldn't even sleep. I slept for 20 minutes tossing and turning because I was so nervous about the first day of chemo where a survivor could have easily stepped up and said, look, 99% of people, your first day chemo, you will feel nothing. And that's the case. That's the truth, which is really settling for a lot of people. But unless the survivor tells you that, it gives you that tip, you're going to spend a lot of time nervous and worried. Yeah. So really just kind of having that knowledge and knowing what's going to happen ahead of time, which is all about what, what you guys do with matching people. What's, what's the best advice you receive from a mentor for running and starting Immerman Angels? Because that's a, that's a huge undertaking. Yes, it's a big undertaking. The best advice that I ever got when I decided this full time was a mentor of mine back in Detroit area. And I went for breakfast with him. You know, I was thinking about doing it full time. And he looked at me and said, Johnny, you got all the successful people I know will tell you pretty much the same thing. They chose to do what they love and then they found a way to do it every day. Because if it's what you love and what you enjoy, and it's in the sphere of what makes you happy, you're gonna work harder, you're gonna be more passionate, your impact's gonna be greater, and you're gonna enjoy the ride and not worry about getting up at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. to go crank on it. And it was the best advice because once I pulled the trigger in uh, July of 06, and decided to do this full time, you know, I never looked back. And all of a sudden, you're helping one guy get him matched up. And the next guy, get him matched up. You just keep going one at a time, one at a time. And um, I really believe that in life. And the listeners out there, whatever you do, if you love being an engineer, because that's where your passion is, if you love building sculptures, if you love being a lawyer, an investment banker, 
or a nonprofit person, whatever it is, or a social worker, you know, if it's what you love and in the sphere that means the most to you, you're going to be the happiest you possibly can be. You can build a career out of it. And uh, I'm a big believer in that. And uh, that was some of the best advice that I got from a personal mentor of mine back in Detroit. And once I pulled the trigger and never looked back, I didn't know how long it would take us to get to this point and keep going. But you know what? You just focus on one life at a time. Help one guy. When he's helped, he's hooked up, then help the next guy. Get to as many as you can with the people you have. Yeah. So, what's one thing you'd recommend the audience do right now if they're going through, whether it's a personal struggle or a business struggle? What's one thing they should start doing right now that would be helpful for them in their current situation? I would say the best thing to do if you you mean to help help Emerman Angels get the word out there or, or someone that's in treatment? Yeah, in treatment or maybe they're going through a real hard you know business situation just like for themselves or whatever they're going through whether it's a health or business what should they start doing to kind of start overcoming because in that moment like they may be alone just in whether it's a business situation that's what people you know go to you for but maybe they're sitting and watching and they're like you know I'm going through this business struggle and there's not like an Immerman Angels for what I'm going through. What what should they start doing? You know, I, I think what the best, I believe in mentoring at my core, core, core fibers. I mean, I believe in it so much that if it's a business thing, you try to find a mentor that's in your business arena, just farther down that you can talk to. And then I really believe there's so many good people in the world. People are inherently good, each one of us. And they love successful people, love sharing what they know to help somebody else. It's a great feeling. That's what we do at Intermittent Angels every day. Most survivors call them successful people, whatever you want, but they've survived their cancer. Right. Sharing the story to be able to help out somebody go through, going through the same thing. Um, but I think in business, it's the same. You try to find someone who's built up something, who's ahead of you, who you can learn from. And um, we've actually had several spin offs of Intermittent Angels. Not even spin-offs, really more like daughter organizations. We've got one that does spinal cord injury, Jeremy. And it's a girl that called me and said, I was in a car accident 13 in a wheelchair, basically paralyzed from here down. And I wish I would have known a big sister who said, oh, yeah, you know, I was in a car accident too when I was 13, but now I'm 30. And I've been there. And I'll talk to you about it. And mm -hmm. one to one, now she does spinal cord injury support. And we've given her a whole model. We've given her our whole technology system, unplug cancer, plug in spinal cord injury, and it works amazing. There's another group out there called Jimmy Insulin, and uh, my friend Jeremy Weisscock called us and said, God, I wish I could do this for diabetes, because I was nine when I got diagnosed with diabetes, and now he matches people who he calls guides, people that have had diabetes maybe 10 years ago and still have it, mentoring newly diagnosed people with diabetes one-to-one. -one. Um, so it really works. Mentoring is just a powerful thing. If you look at the history of mentoring, the first organized system to do good in the world that I've ever seen of mentoring is probably Alcoholics Anonymous, right? A -A -A. Back in the 1930s, somebody realized, two men realized, Bob and Bill, that if you match a guy up who's an alcoholic with, with another guy named Mike, who's your sponsor, is totally sober five years that that's an amazing one to one bond and that's your big brother you call him when you need help he's there to help you yeah. we just simply applied we've come up with anything brilliant we applied that same model to that model applies to cancer yeah and human angels and that's how we do it but I believe in the power of mentoring I believe in the power of empathy and shared experience it's a powerful thing yeah uh, but that's what I would advise somebody going through a difficult yeah Mentorship is powerful. And I have one last question for you, Johnny. Before I ask it, I want you to tell the audience a little bit more about Immortal Angels and what you have that's exciting right now going on. Absolutely. So we do a lot of events in Chicago. We have a running team here in Chicago and beyond. Some of our runners run all over the place. But, um, you know, people can get jerseys and run for us. You you can buy T-shirts on the website. Uh, we make them really cheap. We pretty much break even on the shirts. We just want to get them out there. So much, again, Jeremy, of what we do is awareness, and so much is just spreading the word that, hey, this system's free, and I help anyone with cancer, and it's right here. And the goal is just how do we get it out there. So anyone out there 
want to help spread the word, be a cheerleader, get a t-shirt like this, talk about it, um, get a wristband. You can get a wristband online as well right here. Whatever you want to do to be a part of it, we're free. You're just going to help people reach us in your circles who need us. Yeah. We'll help them out. Yeah, and then for everyone, we tell people the website uh, so they can go and check it out? Sure, it's immermanangels.org, which is I M E R M A N angels.org. There it is right there again. Good. And um, yeah. you can also call us at 312 274 5529. There's eight staff total, uh, six of which are survivors here. So it's a very survivor driven, very passionate crew. And um, we just want impact. You know, they want to work together to reach as many people as we can. Yeah. And anyone out there who's fighting cancer and needs help, please reach out. And anyone out there who's a survivor or a caregiver who wants to give back, please join us. Because as this network of angels grows, the matches are better, and we can have more people. Yeah, it's absolutely unbelievable what you're doing. And I, my last question is, one fact that not everyone knows about fighting cancer that would help them, and I'll tell you the one that I learned from reading what you've written, which I thought was amazing to me, was... One fun fact was simply sucking on Lemonhead's candies uh, allevi- alleviates the metallic taste from chemo. That it's something, I mean, who would know that unless you're talking to a mentor? What's one thing, one fact that, you'd, uh, that amazes you that people should do? Yeah, you know, that's great, and it's so true. I mean, you get this bad taste in your mouth from chemo. It's very metallic. I describe it as you feel like you have nails and screws like in your gums, in your mouth. It's just very metal. So lemonheads are amazing. Lemonheads donates. They've donated actually over 200,000 boxes to us, completely free, co-branded with Intermanandas on one side, lemonheads on the other. And we give them to people for free at hospitals all over. So uh, we're very grateful. They're good people. They, they, they love that their product is being used by people to help. Uh, during something like chemo, which is awesome. So we love the Lemonheads crew. Um, another tip I would say, Jeremy, which is a great one, is oftentimes people get neuropathy, which is a numbness, uh, something called rain out, in their fingertips and in their toes. And that numbness, that, that neuropathy, um, is a really typical side effect of chemo. And what it does is that chemo can force the smaller blood vessels of the capillaries to constrict. And what you want to do is you want to actually increase the blood flow. You want to dilate the vessels to increase the blood flow to counteract that because what happens is the numbness, your fingers will turn white. Sometimes it really hurts. Um, you can barely open a bottle top with it. I mean, it, it can be really bad. And it can kind of come and go with a lot of people and chemo. That's a typical side effect. Now, a great way to add heat to dilate the capillaries to increase the blood flow to lower the numbness and make your hands feel a little better is to dip your hands or your toes into warm water. If you have a bucket of warm water or a bathtub, because what happens is that heat will, will dilate the capillaries, increase blood flow. But a lot of people, it's very typical, get uh, neuropathy on chemo, and it's a great tip to be able to counteract that. And you just wouldn't know that unless the survivor told you and said, listen, here's a great side tip. Sometimes the doctors will mention stuff like that, but usually what happens is the doctors are so busy, as they should be, figuring out which treatments and how to treat someone and curing the patient, that these little ancillary fringe questions that, wait, how can I get more comfortable because this hurts or bothers me, but survivors are the best ones to share and help. Well, Johnny, I want to be the first one to thank you so much. All of you out there should check in. Uh, check out ImmermanAngels.org, and you know I appreciate your time. Thank you, Jeremy. Wish you well, and definitely see you around town. I know we're both local, so look forward to seeing you around town, my man. Awesome. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks a lot, buddy. Be well, okay? Good luck, everybody. Take care.